This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. Doug, what's been happening? We haven't recorded in a while. Yeah, it's um, it's been so long that I was running around like trying to figure out how to do this again. But it's been great. I've actually traveled a bit, um, went to San Diego for a small conference, uh, which was really fun. I went up to uh, Montana for like a beer fest and some beer judging and some little vacationing as well. And other than that, you know, kind of settling in for the fall, but yeah, kind of a busy, busy fall for both of us. Now, what about you? Yeah. Well, before we get to me, I've got a couple of quick follow-ups for you. One is a question and the other one is more of just a, an observation. You were in San Diego. Did you go to any breweries? I know you were recently there and you said you had Quite a few beers, I guess. Right. How was it this time? Did you partake in the scene? I only went to, I think, one brewery, which I, I can't even remember the name of, but I was there for a conference and I was I was actually like speaking slash on a panel. So we went to the conference center, very nice resort. It's like an Omni resort, something or other in Carlsbad. So super nice and largely just stayed there. Um and then visited our mutual friend, uh, David, uh, downtown. And that's when I went to uh, a brewery, but it was fine. You know, it was, it was really conference focused and I didn't have a whole lot of downtime for drinking. Okay, cool. It's better that way. Did you learn anything or get anything out of the conference or? Yeah, there were a couple, uh, there was a big emphasis on video. So, uh, it was mostly a kind of a, a blogging and content type conference focused on like display ads, but there was a huge focus on video and it's great because I've been dabbling with video for five to six years. So I kind of have my head around it. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed in the last couple of years is I have what I consider like a, a modest YouTube channel. I've been working at it for a while. It's been fun, but there's like 35,000 subscribers and that takes a little while to get to. So there are people that, um, that have focused in other areas. Maybe they write books, maybe they're bloggers, maybe they're podcasters and they're trying to figure out how to do video. And, um, I'm, I'm good at video. So it's, it's kind of, kind of interesting. So video is big if you, if you didn't know, and it's, like a growing industry. So I would encourage people, if you're thinking of dabbling, like it's a great thing to learn because it's kind of hard to do. And if you know how to do it, then a lot of people will be interested in like learning those skills or, you know, if you want to get a job, like that's a thing that could be fun to do. Okay. I've heard that like YouTube is the new frontier. So on that, you said you're good at video. I don't want to get too deep down this rabbit hole. So this is the last question. I'm sure you know what a deep fake is, right? Yeah. I wonder if you could shallow fake me to make me look a little bit better. Like it'll still be me, but like take 10% body fat off me and put it on like 10% muscle. Can you, do you think you could do that? I think so. I think we just need like, um, like a TikTok filter or an Instagram filter and it'll just slim you up just a tad. Okay. Awesome. You'll have to do it incrementally. So <laughs> it's not a, a big change. People be like, what is he on steroids or something? Like, no, it's just been working out. <laughs> the, uh, the other, like, I will be um, taking family portraits for you. So it's one thing I have a, an interest in photography and videography, and that's kind of how a lot of that got started, but I'm going to be taking um, some pictures of you and your family. And one thing that I can do is make you look much better. Awesome. <laughs> I'm kind of terrified of that, by the way, we're going on so many tangents. Usually this doesn't happen until the <laughs> middle of the show, but bear with us. I hope this is entertaining. I'm kind of terrified about that actually, because Mindy came in a couple weeks ago. She's like, hey, guess what I bought at Target? I'm like, what? She's like, I bought us matching family pajamas. I'm like, <laughs> like, what the hell did you do that for? Like, I don't even wear pajamas, uh, which is another <laughs> conversation. But anyway, I'm like, why? She's like, well, Doug's going to take our family photos. And I, I figured we could all get dressed up in these. I'm like, uh, okay, I, I wish you would have. 
<laughs> ask Love for it. my uh, opinion beforehand. So, yeah. so dog, if I seem kind of uh, uh, glum when you're taking the pictures or angry or anxious, uh, that's why. Okay. No, no, I, I envision it. And I didn't tell Mindy this. And I don't think she listens to the show, but I I think it'll be like those awkward family photos, you know, that website or that yeah. sort of genre. It'll be like that. You'll be floating in the background. There'll be like a fucking random cat or something like that. <laughs> uh, wh- whatever you're in, like shooting a dinosaur. I don't know. We'll make it fit y'all. So. Okay. Maybe we could have those lasers. Remember when they used to do, do that like in the <laughs> 80s psh, in the background, like purple and yeah. on the wall? Yeah. Okay. And you'll everyone will have their, their hand, uh, yes. like their... their I'm trying to describe like you, you rest your, your head on your, your fist and you kind of look sideways. It'll, it'll be like that. I think that was a Napoleon dynamite when the one guy is getting his picture taken and, uh, yeah. And every other real estate agent picture looks like that too. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So it's been, it's been a little busy. I actually did like a small or very, uh, small portrait session with a family. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. There was even, uh, there were a couple children involved, which I'm not great with kids, but it worked out okay. I don't know. Did you see those pictures? I have not seen them, but I think I know who you're talking about. And they were okay. small children, right? Like babies or almost babies? Or- yeah, baby. And then my, I mean, my threshold, I have like under 10 and like under 18. And then I don't know after that. So yeah, yeah it's hard for me to tell. Small. Yeah. No, I think she was like four. Yeah. Okay. So young kids, but they did great. You know, worked out fine. I think you're going to be okay. I'll make you feel comfortable. I appreciate that, Doug. I'll, I'll drink before the session. <laughs> so um, what have you been up to? Yeah, so we bought that project house, and I have been working on that. It is close to being finished, actually. We decided to gut the master bath because we were ahead of schedule. I wasn't going to do that, but the bathroom was super ugly. So we're like, yeah, let's just tear this up. So we did that. I'm rebuilding that now after that. We have to sand down the floors, which I'm going to get help with because I've never done that before. And then I think it'll be kind of done whether or not we're able to find a renter after that, given the current economic conditions is a whole other question. But yeah, I'll be happy to be done with the work. And Doug, I got to tell you, it's made me realize something about myself. And that thing is that I'm done with this shit. I'm not going to work in any more houses. I'm going to finish this one up, finish up our primary house, which still isn't finished after three years and then be done for now. I've got too many other things I want to do in life. I'll retire for real after that. Okay. I'll play back this clip and everyone that's listening and watching, you know, if you hear about Carl thinking about buying another house, just remind him that he said this. No more houses unless someone else is going to do all the work on it. I'll back you financially, but that's the end of my involvement. And I think, um, I hate to break it to you. I think you said that before already, like before the other house. But um, Yeah, I think you're right. Keep me honest. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's, it's in the archives, but, um, but you're almost done with this one. So that's cool. And then you'll be able to finish your primary house because there's like a, your kitchen has to couple things to do, right? Yeah, kitchen. We have to gut the master bath on that too, another <laughs> bathroom. It's going to be a while before we're done, at least another six months, but hopefully by summer of 2023. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. Or so. taking. So we have a mailbag episode for today, which is awesome. We've been you know, getting a lot of questions in and we've been logging them. There's actually going to be you know, a couple episodes with this. And if you do have questions, you can send it in. And Carl, you have locked down our email addresses, right? Yes, I think we actually know what they are. They are carl at milehighfi.com and doug at milehighfi.com. I have to clarify, Doug I thought this would be common wisdom, but it's not. It's D-O-U-G. It is not D-O-U-G-H, as someone recently spelled it. Yeah, that's a, it's a very common and uh, I would say shocking <laughs> misspelling. But yeah, a lot of people will throw in the, the H at the end. And I don't know. I like bread. I like pizza dough. I don't, I don't take offense. I, I used to take offense to it, but I don't think anyone is maliciously calling me dough. Maybe it's a Scottish thing. Like Edinburgh has a H on the end, but it's a silent H. So yeah. so yeah, maybe it's a sign of sophistication. People think you're more sophisticated than you actually are. Not that you're not sophisticated, but, <laughs> but that's an elite level of sophistication, Doug, or dough. 
If you have Duff. questions that you want us to cover in the future, uh, on topic, off topic, we take it all. You can shoot us an email and we will start putting our email addresses in the show notes too. So we want to make it easy and uh, we appreciate everyone that sent in questions. We have a few and first one's from Clay. Do you want to? Yeah. Lead? Yeah, sure. I'll kick it off. This one came in via email. He's, Clay says, I'm a big fan have you ever considered fire wouldn't easily be possible without most of society working and, and is in all caps, by the way, for, for emphasis, working and consuming at high level to generate revenue profits for businesses at the rate necessary to grow and maintain stock market invested portfolios? A paradox? If most people, I don't have my reading glasses, most people fire to fire, fire would be much harder Okay, so if most people fired, fire would be much harder to achieve, maintain. And, and that last thing was a question. So if most people were fired, would fire be much harder? What, what do you think about this, Doug? I have strong opinions on this you one. Too. Okay. Well, generally, I don't think about these high-level ideas that are a little more philosophical uh, most of the time. So I'm glad that Clay did ask this. So I think that there's so few people that actually try to do what we're doing, even though like we're in this kind of, uh, kind of an echo chamber where there's a lot of us around that are doing a similar thing. It feels like everyone is doing it, but it's so fucking few people, like hardly anyone is even thinking about saving money and retiring early. And it's, it's kind of amazing. The other part is you mentioned people consuming at a high level to generate profits. I mean, we kind of uh, sadly live in such a con consumer-based culture that I have no fear that people are not going to keep making bad decisions <laughs> and buying a bunch of shit they don't need. I, I just don't. Th there's too many, like, there's too many uh, maybe, like, ads and too many full industries dedicated to making sure that people are buying a bunch of stuff. So I think it's, it's really hard to not do it. Even like when you and I are maybe trying not to be consumers, like we're still doing it. Like you bought you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of materials to improve a house. Right. But it, you're still spending like tens of thousands of dollars to do that stuff. So I don't think this is a risk. Um, the way our sort of Western culture is built. I don't think it's a problem. What do you think? Yeah, so I'm curious. I, I have those same thoughts. A few, so a two-part question or one question with two nuances. If you went to downtown Longmont and asked 100 people who Mr. Money Mustache was, how many people would know? And if you went to any other major city like Chicago and you asked 100 people, how many do you think would know who Mr. Money Mustache is, one of the biggest people in this community? Yeah, I mean, in Longmont, maybe, maybe – 10 and probably five of them would think that that was the pawn shop <laughs> that used to be next door. Oh, what was that called? Like money? Uh, Mr. Money. Yeah. It was Mr. Money, I think. Yeah. Mr. Money pawn shop or something. So probably not many. And then a bigger city. Yeah. I think it would be even less deeper into your question. I've gone to the last two FinCons and I would say half the people I met have never heard of Mr. Money Mustache. So, and that is like a place where a lot of people should, have. and granted, I'm, I've met people from like a, a wide range of industries and stuff. So there's a lot of people like not directly in the fire community or personal finance. If they're in the fire community, of course, they've heard of Pete. But yeah, even at a big conference where most people are into personal finance, he's not even on the radar. Never even heard of him, no stories. No idea who he is. Yep. Yeah. I was thinking between 5 and 10% in Longmont and then maybe 1% in a major city. But I think even those numbers might be enthusiastic. But yeah, I had all the same thoughts as you, Doug. If you think about all the products that are advertised on TV, we've got all these people that want to sell our, our, us products who make them. And then we've got another layer of people who just do the marketing. So there's people who do nothing but figure out how to sell all this crap to us. And I looked this up. Uh, Super Bowl ad for the last Super Bowl was six point five million f for thirty seconds. Wow. Us fire people are pretty cheap asses. We're, we're we like to spread the message to talk about it, but we certainly aren't going to spend any of our own money to talk about it. So, well, I think 
this guy is right. If this ever happened, if everyone become fired, it would be different. It would change everything, but it's just never going to happen. So it's not even worth, it's kind of an interesting thought exercise, but it's never going to happen. One thing that could be interesting and someone probably in the audience has uh, some data or can point us toward data rather. I wonder if there's some communities where it is more common for people to, you know, retire or like ease into retirement. And maybe, you know, most of us are still doing some kind of productive activity where we kind of earn a little bit of money, but we're not at a corporate job anymore. So I'm sure there are places where, you know, most people don't do like corporate work and they, it's more like communal or something like that kind of hippie-ish. I don't know, but they must be out there, right? Yeah, I think so. I'm kind of thinking of the blue blue zones, like these yeah. beach towns where people have a lot of more interesting things to do and probably better community, maybe parts of Portugal, Greece, parts of Japan. And I'll bet the problem kind of takes care of itself because if everyone's not out buying everything, you probably need less money to live. People are more helpful and uh, everything is just cheaper. A lot of those countries probably have centralized health care, so you don't have that. So even if everyone did become like this, I don't think it would be an issue. Yeah. People would probably be happier, not stressed out, not sitting in traffic, that kind of thing. So, okay, cool. And if people have thoughts on that, uh, maybe to challenge some of our assumptions there, then uh, yeah, shoot us an email on that. Next up. Oh, actually, I'll let Carl do this one too. Yeah, this is a correction. So when we interviewed Leaf, we were talking to him about his altruism, how he's giving a lot of money away. And I mistakenly said that Warren Buffett had agreed to give away most of his money upon his death. This is called the giving pledge, which I I don't remember who started it, but I know Mark Zuckerberg was one of the early people in that he might have started it. But the mistake I made is it's not upon death. You could start giving away your money at any age and according to to our, this email from a reader whose name I did not write down. Uh, Buffett started giving away his money at age 76. And Buffett's pretty old, so he's already given away billions and billions of dollars. So the correction is you can give your money away for the giving pledge before you croak. You don't have to wait till you die to give it all away. And, that's, um, and, and I think uh, listener Bill wrote that in. So thanks, Bill, for for correcting us and keeping us honest here. And that, I mean, that's a whole topic that we've kind of looked at a little bit, but yeah. Do you have any like big plans to give away money or anything in place right now? Yeah. Well, because of uh, current economic conditions, I'm way down. So yeah, I'm, I'm not thinking in that mode yet, but eventually I will. And I would like to do some good with it before I die. And I, I think it'd be fun. I haven't thought a whole lot about it. I want to get my kids through college and out of the house, but it would be fun to do some local initiatives, even if it was anonymous, just to see the effects of your money directly. Like it'd be cool to take a walk to the library and see an addition on the library because you gave them a bunch of money or something like that. So yeah, I think we, if things continue to go well, 4% rule holds up and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I look forward to giving a lot of it away probably in like 10 or 15 years, start doing that. How, how about you, Doug? No, haven't looked at it as closely. And I think um, we're a few years behind where you are economically. And then, yeah, the market's down too. So yeah, we're not quite thinking of that sort of stuff yet. Um, and we're so much younger than you. So no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, we haven't moved to that. And it, it is tough. I mean, that is one of the struggles because we're we're working for many years thinking, all right, we want to save, we want to be frugal, we're trying to cut cost. And then if you are, like, if you're just looking at the numbers and you're like, fuck, I'm not going to give away like 20%, that's bananas. Like that messes up the whole math, like of the whole thing. I may as well buy like a new car or something. Uh, obviously, a new car for me doesn't help anyone else. <laughs> But you get the point, right? Like it, we're trying to save money and then all of a sudden we're like, we're just going to give it away and maybe it gets lost. Unfortunately, like admin and just um, like the bureaucracy of big organizations. So I don't know. Yeah. It'd be nice to be well past your number and in a super secure situation before starting any of that, which is what I think I'll do. Yeah. Okay. 
Very good. So that's something we'll put a pin in and probably come back to. So coming up next, this is uh, Matt from YouTube. Love or money? I like this. It could be like a reality show. Matt says, I feel like it's taking so long to get to Phi. I'm 32. My wife is 29 and we're having our first baby and we'll most likely take a few years off working. My wife will take a few years off working. We have saved 350K. I'm a teacher and high school football coach. I'm totally burned out on teaching algebra, but I can't imagine giving up coaching. Five feels so far away, but I also don't want to be miserable for seven to 10 years because I took a job just for the money. Should I stick with something I love-ish for 20 more years or shift to something I don't in order to retire early? Really good question. And I mean, just to compliment you guys on picking up on the Phi concepts. Um, sounds like in your late twenties or so, that's fantastic. Uh, that's way more money that, than we had when we were 30. So yeah, good job so far. Any initial thoughts, Carl? Uh, my initial thought is, first of all, they're doing really well. She's in 29 and she has 350,000 yeah. saved up. Let's say they, they don't touch that. And it doubles every seven years with dividend reinvestment, which is what it normally does. By the time they're, she's 36, they'll have 700. By the time she's 43, they'll have 1.4 million. So she'll be 43 and he'll be 46. That's a significant chunk of change. They're, they're doing very well as far as money. Yeah. And, you know, one thing, one thing to consider also, like we, we often talk about, people hit their sort of phi mark or maybe a coast phi uh, range, which I think uh, essentially they're probably at a coast phi area right now. And they don't have to completely stop working. So maybe they roll with this for another few years, maybe just a couple, and then maybe you get a part-time job or get another job that is better that you don't hate. Maybe you can uh, volunteer or you know do some part-time coaching as an assistant coach. I don't know how it works, but I imagine that you can come in as like someone who doesn't actually teach and help coach. I, I think that would probably be valid, right? Um, and then it, it changes the math. Even if you're only making say, you know, 30K a year, like it dramatically changes what you need to have in the bank because you're not drawing down on your, you know, initial savings and capital and retirement nest egg. So, I mean, I think... You know, don't be miserable. I, I would imagine that's probably like the best move. Don't be miserable for a long time. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say too. If you don't like teaching algebra, figure out how to, how to get out of that. I don't know if it's easy to teach something else or, yeah, like you said, figure out some other course in life, but and still do the teaching. He says he loves coaching, so I'm sure there'd be a way to do that. But yeah, life is too short. I'm going to get to this in a future question, but you need to enjoy the journey. You can't just be focused on that goal because the goal will come and go, but the journey is where you're going to spend all of your time. So it's time to figure out another path in life. And it doesn't even matter if it takes a little bit longer, they're doing great. So everything is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you like the coaching, but you hate the algebra, like, yeah, figure out if you could adjust that a little bit, but yeah, it would be tough to, um, you know, switch to a job that you just take for the money, there could be a chance that you like it or that you're good at it. So, I mean, you could experiment and test it out, maybe on a small scale, maybe figure out if you can, you know, do it as a side hustle, as a contractor, like if, as a, and as just a little experiment, I guess. Um, because it may turn out that you, you like doing the thing that earns more money, maybe rare, otherwise they wouldn't pay a lot of money for it, <laughs> but yeah, one point regarding the situation now is we really need workers. So if there's ever a good time to experiment with this type of thing with a new career, it could be right now. If you if you wanted to experiment with a career where you had to get a job, where would it be? Oh man, uh, are there any parameters around it? Or if I had no. to get a job, oh man, that's a difficult question. Uh, I don't know. It's not so much the job, it's having autonomy around my job. Maybe some kind of, I enjoy the coding thing, maybe not for a medical device like I did before, yeah. but being able to code and maybe just on a project basis where I can work as many hours or as few hours as I want, as long as I get to a certain point by a certain time. Okay. 
I have a suggestion. Is, and that's Taco Bell. Because, I, you know, I think you'd probably get decent discounts. You're there anyway, right? Yeah, true. They brought the Mexican pizza back. I'm so happy. Yeah. It's great. You can walk to it, you know, so you get exercise. And I don't know. You maybe could be a manager. And they need people too. So, Doug... I do go to, I've cut down my Taco Bell. It might be once a month or so now, but I did go there. And when I go to Taco Bell, I don't like buying my food through the drive through because when you take it home, it's all cold. And I don't like eating in the car. Like Taco Bell is not good car food because you bite the taco, the shell disintegrates, and half your shit is in your lap, right? So I like to go in there, use the machine so I don't have to interact with anyone, and then get, get my food when they call my name. But the lobby's always closed. They've got a sign there like, we cannot find people. Sorry, you must use the drive through So I, oh, I, think, I think you're onto something. I, I wonder how much they pay. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the fast food places are paying like pretty decent, like more than we made like in our early jobs. So yeah, you, you, you're right about that. I passed by a McDonald's and they were offering like 18 or 19 bucks an hour. And I made like 36 at my first job. So it's about the same. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, kind of amazing. But I think- you could probably work there. I bet you can. Yeah. And I didn't get free food at my first job either. I would get free food from either of these, I, I hope. Yeah. And I would maybe check out, I like coffee and I, I like a coffee shop vibe. So I would maybe check out, there's a place close by. It's like that red frog coffee that I could walk to. So I would maybe um, check that out. That could be fun. I could go early in the morning, you know, finish up early that, or, you know, maybe another, uh, like a retail shop. Walmart, something like that. Would it be Walmart or like a small shop on Main Street? I, I, I don't know. Personally, I don't think working for Walmart would be that much fun. Yeah, I don't think so either. But in a big, in a, th this is how I navigated my corporate career as, as well. Um, in a big place like Walmart, you can just fuck around. Like they're not going to know. But a small shop, you know, I don't want to hurt small business. But, um, you know, Walmart, Sam's, like whatever. Maybe you could drive that uh you know, they have those uh, big sweeper mop things oh, nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just put my headphones on, like cruise around in the little, it's like a riding lawnmower. Like that was the height of luxury when we were kids, right? I know. We dreamed of the day that we could ride on one of those when we were like eight years old. I agree. I was at a Costco and like a couple of the workers, no, it was floor and decor. I was buying tile and the workers had those ear pod things on. So they're probably listening to podcasts or probably getting educated or music or whatever. So yeah, work, work is a lot more tolerable, I think, than it used to be. Yeah. And then the good part in, in either case, like if they tried to tell us what to do, we would just be like, okay, that's great. And we wouldn't really care. We'd just do whatever we want anyway. I would drive that thing right out the front door and just <laughs> continue on with it. See how far I could get away with it. Yeah. And they're like uh, autonomous now, right? At, at the Sam's anyway. So you could get it out on the highway, see what it could do, see how it reacts to cars. Okay, back on track. So uh, Matt, I think you're on the right track. Uh, you know, don't be miserable. Whatever you're doing, like life's short. You don't know what's going to happen in next weeks or years or something like that. So, all right. We have another one coming up, uh, actually a couple from uh, Rakesh via Instagram. So Rakesh, thanks for the support um, overall. And first question here, what advice for your younger self that is not uh, financial, financially related, what would you give to yourself? So, and we'll just pick an age and say like 20. Okay. I have a couple of them. I actually have three of them. Do you want to go back and forth or should I go for all of them? I'll, um, I'll, I'll go first, uh, and I'll, I don't know if I'll have more, but the number one thing when I was 20, I probably would have, um, told myself to take Toastmasters, uh, or go to Toastmasters meetings and just learn to speak confidently and be comfortable speaking in front of a group. Ooh, that, that's a great one. I think um, that would have changed a lot of things from being able to communicate in like a job interview situation and just relatively uh, being more secure and confident to speak in front of people, which people are fucking terrified of, right? Like, you know, that's one of your uh, stories over the last couple of years, one of the skills you've developed and it was really hard, but you, you got over it and I've slowly gotten better as well. 
So that would have been great. Toastmasters. Okay. So you're pretty good at it. If you were asked to speak at a big thing like the economy with like 500 people, would you do it? Potentially. And actually, I was just invited to a, a different conference, but for the marketing side. And there's some travel constraints, but otherwise I would do it if it was down the street, but it's in the UK. So I may have to travel and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it'll probably be 700 people, something like that. Okay. So I probably would. The UK, yeah. that's pretty fancy. Can I come with? I'll carry your bags. I'll fluff your pillow. Yeah, you can actually. I'll, there's some stuff is paid for, uh, not the flight, not the expensive part, but um, yeah, we'll talk about it because um, Elizabeth sounds like she may not come. <laughs> Man, sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. U- UK is cool. Okay, what's yours? I had three of them. My first one is to learn how to properly strength train and do that while you're young. Um, I was listening to Peter Tia, and he was saying that you have a window of opportunity when you're young to really put on strength. And I never wanted to be a meathead, but that would help you grow old effectively because you've got this narrow window where you can really put on muscles. After that, your joints degrade and your testosterone decreases. So I wish I would have done more of that when I was younger to give me resilience. Uh, my second one was study computers, and I guess I'm kind of cheating here because he said non-financial advice. I started out as a biology and chemistry major, and I went to pharmacy school, and I hated that. I eventually wound up in computers, but it was through a roundabout way. I wish I would have just done it in school because I really enjoyed it when I finally got around to doing it, and I probably would have uh, been a little bit better off financially if I would have done that from the get-go. Uh, My third one, this is more of a philosophical one, and something I've been thinking a lot about lately is de-emphasize goals in favor of the journey. And what made me start thinking about this was I was considering happiness, and uh, I consider happiness like a short, fleeting thing, like you accomplish something great during the day or that week or whatever, you're, you're ecstatic for a short period of time, and then you go back to whatever your steady state is. Uh, so it, you get some of that when you accomplish a goal, but it's fleeting and I don't think happiness or at least that form of it should be a goal in itself. So I think you should focus on the journey in life. And one thing I was thinking about, I'm trying to learn a piano piece and it'll be cool if I actually can can play the, the thing in a couple of months, but I need to enjoy it like every day when I get a little bit better and relish that because I'll accomplish it and then that'll be short lived and then that will be gone. So I need to find deep contentment through the journey and everyday living. How are you going to do that? Uh, Well, uh, guitar has tablature, which is kind of a a cheat where you just see the six strings and the number on there. Uh, I've got the iPad and instead of reading music, which I am getting better at too, they have the thing where they show a keyboard and then the keys light up and they show, they kind of tell you which one is going to light up. So I've been doing that. But doing that at the same time, that'll help me with the mechanics, but learning how to read music at the same time as well. Mm. Or I meant, how are you going to find happiness uh, by being challenged each day? Which I, I'll, I'll jump in to give you a second to think, but I know I haven't been playing guitar as much, but I know as I was struggling through learning finger style, it was really slow. And I did, it was, um, well, frustrating, but as I was slowly making progress, like each day I was like, oh, it is getting better. Unfortunately for like the first three weeks, uh, there was no progress and you just like kept doing the same thing. And you're like, surely I should be getting a little bit better. Um, And then all of a sudden there's a little bit of a breakthrough. And then once I hit that sort of, uh, once I caught a little momentum, then I started finding it enjoyable, even just like the slow mechanics of it all because I knew that I was making progress even though it never felt like it. So that said, um, is there a way that you will find or a strategy that you'll use to find joy and happiness in the process along the way as you're struggling through? Yeah, that's a great question, Doug. I'd love to hear what readers, what listeners have to say about it. But yeah, off the top of my head, it all depends on where you put your, what your focus is, I guess. You can't become, it, it, it's how you interpret the struggle, the day-to-day struggle. You can't be frustrated by it. You should embrace it because there's going to be little wins. And it's focusing on the day-to-day 
struggle in the day-to-day practice instead of that end goal. So putting the end goal maybe out of your mind, and if you your mind wanders to that, trying to refocus and dismiss that in favor of the day-to-day enjoyment of whatever you're doing. So yeah. It's almost like you have to like trick your brain to think like, oh yeah, this this is uh, this is fun. <laughs> this is making me happy. Now, before we hit the next question from Rakesh, um, in practicing stuff like that, where it's like a purely leisure uh, hobby, playing piano or guitar, do you struggle with thinking about how that's like quote not productive because you're like a pretty productive person like you've said before like you hate to see waste in in any form right and like you could there's an opportunity cost right you could be swinging a hammer doing something that's like truly productive where you see output not bad piano playing so do you struggle with like doing leisure activities and not being productive I used to, but not so much anymore. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Number one is we have enough money. There's not really any need to focus on things to make more money. But the other thing, and this is more important, I think, and that the mental challenge of it, and this, I could make the same argument for learning a language. It's exercise for your brain. So it's important to exercise your body, to stave off injuries, breaking your hip and all that. And it's important to keep your mind active at probably help stave off dementia, stuff like that. Uh, I guess the real general advice I can give, it's always better to be a producer of something than a consumer of something. So if you're in your free time, you could sit there and watch TV, which doesn't exercise your brain at all. You're just absorbing some crap in front of the screen versus working out your brain and trying to get better at something. So no, I, I don't regret it or I don't feel bad about it at all. Um, the other thing, I think it's a challenge too, cause I, the, the common wisdom is you have to do a lot of things when you're young. Like you'll pick up a language a lot easier when you're younger, learn an instrument. And while that's probably true, I kind of like to, I find that a challenge. Like you can't do this. So then I want to do it even more. Yeah. And I think like the more, the more things that are new that you're learning it makes your you know, brain more malleable to like learn more things. So the more you learn the more new things you learn, the more new thing, or the easier it is to learn more new things. Is that a, was that a real sentence? Does that make sense? Um, I don't think it was a real sentence, but I <laughs> I catch your drift. I know what you were saying there. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So, you know, if you're if you're young, take take our advice. Take you know, Toastmasters, the stuff Carl said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's a good summary. Um, all right, Rakesh actually has a few questions um, left, but we're going to have to do just one more in the next episode of Mailbag. There are um, there's some hard-hitting questions, so we'll, we'll cover those next time, but just a little teaser. All right, last one. Is it difficult or easy to make friends post-retirement from a nine-to-five? And that's uh, from Patrick. Uh, Patrick from BC also asked, how do you meet people? Yeah, I think Rakesh is asking a good question, but it might be the wrong question. I'll tell you a little story, Doug. I've probably told you this before. When I had my first job, it was working in the IT department at Sears. It was when Sears was going downhill. They hadn't gone bankrupt yet, which was fairly recent, but they kept on having these rounds of layoffs. Like every couple of months, they would have a round of layoffs and you'd see like, a, I don't know, maybe 10% of your peers just disappear one day and one day I'm sitting there at my desk and my manager comes up to me. He's like, hey, hey, Carl, you know there's going to be layoffs tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. He's like, you you are not going to get get laid off, but Chuck, this guy across the aisle is. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, that's too bad. So then the next day came and I saw Chuck's manager come get the guy to tell him the bad news. And then he uh, – it, it just set the stage. This guy was like a bodybuilder guy, like a real tough – like not tough, but a strong guy, fit uh, dude. So – it, and then he came back to pack up his cube and this guy was crying, just bawling his eyes out. I'm like, oh my God, I feel so bad. I wanted to cry because this guy was in such bad shape. And I, I started thinking about it. And uh, I was pretty young when I worked there. And Sears had all this stuff going on for like the younger employees. Like they had a flag football team and they would decorate floats for like Chicago or Thanksgiving Day Parade and, and, and do all this other shit. And this guy was into all that stuff. Like he would work out at the Sears gym, like Sears was that guy's life. And I saw this guy, I'm like, my God, like I really want to get along with my coworkers, but it, 
and it's okay if they're friends, but I want to keep that pretty loose. I don't want to be tied down to my job like Chuck was, because look at this, he got canned. And his whole life is like upended and down the drain. So my first piece of advice to Rakesh would be to, it's certainly okay to be on good terms and get along with your coworkers, but uh, keep boundaries around that too. Because I mean, another thing, if you really like your people, you might not want to quit either, even if you get a better opportunity. So I would be very cautious about having good friends at work. And just to counter that, I some of my good friends I met at work and then we just kept in touch afterwards. So uh, I don't know what Chuck's problem was, but he could pick up the fucking phone and like still be friends with the people, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess he could have, but it wouldn't have been quite the same. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good, that is a good story. And some people do, it, like it, his identity was tied up in the job and the company, I think. Yeah. So, but he could have been friends with the same people, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and to dig into the question a, a little bit more, I found it, you know, generally the same to make friends with people. So one interesting aspect, like, uh, my wife and I do not have kids and a lot of our friends started having kids when, you know, when people start having kids and then we stop hanging out with them because we have different friends and, and different interests and they end up uh, generally making friends with other people with kids because they're around doing activities. So like we lost a decent number of friends, but we meet other people like, you know, uh, maybe neighbors or maybe there's like some activity groups that you can go to. Like we've been taking dance lessons, which I think you and Mindy are going to join us sometime soon, but I don't I know if that's not. true. Yeah. But, you know, dance lessons and, you know, those are pretty fun. Like it's a common interest group. And it spans, uh, you know, economics, it spans races, like there's tons of different people and ages and whatever. So you can meet a lot of people. And then I met a lot of folks uh, through like beer clubs and other things like that. So again, it spans all uh, demographics and we have a common interest of beer. Uh, my wife, Elizabeth, she plays tennis. So she would make friends uh, in that area too. So I think if you just find like an activity group, like you'll be able to, to meet people just as easy. So. Yeah, I do think there's a second component to it, but first I want to build on what you said a little bit. If you're in the FI community and want to meet people, go join a choose FI group or go to some local meetup. I know there's Mr. Money Mustache forums. I just saw they had a big thing in Moab where a bunch of them went there and camped out, which is pretty cool. But I think there's a second component to it. I think from going to these groups and just, interacting with humans in general, a lot of people are pretty passive. If you really want to make new friends, I think you should take some initiative. Like if you're at the group and someone's like, hey, I'm working on a project at my house. Hey, I've got those skills. Maybe I could help you out. Or let's say, hey, you, you two seem interesting. Do you want to come over for dinner and cook out or something like that? You have to take some initiative too. You can't just be completely passive if you want to make new friends and build a community. And I don't think most people probably won't take that step. I, I notice in our community, there's one or two people, like a friend Eric is always like, let's go mountain biking or let's do this. And and most people he asks will agree to do it, but those people wouldn't have asked in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, like, I've found different contexts, but basically like if you're the hub, you can like organize exactly what you want, invite the people that you want. And then you end up, you know, you don't have to like, talk in front of a group or anything like that, you could just invite, you know, whatever five or 10 people individually and then create sort of your own little group. And then the other big hack, which we've cheated here in Longmont, like there's just a lot of people that have our similar values and interest. And there's a really easy way at the co-working space to meet, you know, dozens of people in like one outing. And then, you know, you're not going to click with everyone, but you'll click with a couple people. So, you know, like you said, the Choose FI groups are going to be awesome if you can find a, a group close to you. Yeah. Uh, the Corkin space is a great suggestion. A lot of people join it. Uh, and I know this because I'm one of the owners of it, so I give tours, but a lot of people will be new to town and looking for a community and join it. But Again, if you do that, you have to be active and put yourself out there. You can't just be passive. Like I always try to reach out to new people and say, hey, we're having this and this event and uh, you, you should come out for it. There's going to be people, similar people to you there. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, one more point and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, 
I joined the co-working space. Um, I thought it would work there occasionally, but it turned out I like working at home more. But it's a great social area. And I wanted to, you know, improve my speaking, you know, kind of playing on the idea from before. And I was like, hey, like, I think you guys do like little, you know, just workshops or someone will talk if they're an expert in an area. And I came in and gave a talk on SEO. And I thought maybe like four or five people would show up or something. And there were like 20. Um, I think you were there that day, right? Yes. So yeah, like a bunch of people showed up and I gave a, a little talk. I had a presentation and I got to practice like pretty low stakes, even though there were like a lot more people than I expected. And, you know, it was, it was free. Uh, no one, I wasn't trying to sell anything. I just wanted to, you know, get in front of people, uh, share some knowledge. Um, some people got something out of it. And the thing is I met like 20 people and they all thought, oh, Doug's pretty nice because he did his presentation for free. So that was like a quick way just to meet a lot of people really fast without having to directly put myself out there asking individuals. Um, so that, that worked out well. If you, if you are comfortable, like giving a presentation, that's a nice little hack. Yeah, that's a great one. So very cool. Well, anything else um, on your mind, Carl, before we wrap it up? Yeah. I, well, I think a lot of what Rakesh asked goes back to confidence too. Um, yeah. If you're meek and afraid, you're not going to connect with people. So yeah, act like you own the place, go in there. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier to make friends. What's that wait but why post that I always talk about? The, yeah. Why you should stop caring what people think. That's probably yeah the most important piece of advice I could give to someone. Stop giving a shit. Yeah. Well, the, the funny, it's funny the way you phrase that because you literally do own the co-working space. You're like, walk in there like you own the place. And yeah, easy for you to say. But <laughs> the thing is, um, both I think both you and I are pre were pretty shy before, but we're a lot more confident now, right? Yes, I would say so. Yeah, I was like terrified to talk to anyone. Um, even like at work giving presentations, or not presentations, but doing an introduction, like maybe a couple teams get together and you're in a big conference room. I'm like, I'm Doug and I do testing sometimes. And then like, you know, fucking terrified. Like that's how, that's how like shy and, like lack of confidence I had. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't guess that now. Yeah. Now, I'm, now I'm just like a cocky, you know, <laughs> got all these tattoos on my arm. I think I'm something else. Yeah. I think you've gone overboard. You, <laughs> you need to course correct. Uh, you told me about that piercing and I don't know if that's such a good idea, but I mean, if, if you want to, you do you. I don't want to see it uh, judging where, where you told me it's going to be. Yeah. I don't, I have no need to see that, but yeah, it's going to be painful and you might. Yeah. I, I don't want to give it away. Thanks. Thanks. That'll be on the, uh, on the only fans page, which we are actually rolling something out pretty soon. So there'll be an announcement, um, or maybe the announcement is already out, but we will link up and we actually do have a bit of a donation model. So there'll be a little bit more information and kind of a work in progress. And we're excited to, you know, cover some costs because this thing isn't free and, uh, all of our, all of our vendors are raising their prices. So inflation, damn it. Yeah. So, all right, Carl, it's been good catching up and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see you around. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington, the balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person. So the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using. And that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week.
Carl, it's been a while. What's been going on? I have been working on a house. So we bought our fixer upper house and I've been devoting most of my waking hours that are not with the children to fixing that thing up. Cool. How's it been going? It's going pretty well. We are actually farther ahead than I thought we would be. So we added some more work to it, expanded our scope. We are now gutting the master bath. Actually, it is all gutted. Now I am rebuilding it. And then we'll be kind of done. I, a bunch of little projects after that, and it'll be ready to rent. Sweet. And then did you get any listeners or viewers uh, to help you out? I know you you posed that uh, request and some people reached out. I did. There were a couple of them actually that came over and did help out. One guy, Bob, was on a cross-country trip on his way to the mountains. He's like, hey, do you mind if I hang out at the place and acclimate and I'll help you do some stuff? And he was uh, super useful. So Bob... If you're listening, thank you. And and Bob, actually, a funny story. He left his vice grips. You know what vice grips are, right? Mm-hmm. He left his vice grips at my house accidentally. So I'm like, hey, Bob, do you want me to send them back? He's like, nah, you, you can leave them. So I got googly eyes. I've got a bag of these things with, with uh, they've got a sticky bag. So I put googly eyes on the on the vice grips and I take them around Longmont and take goofy pictures of them, <laughs> like in front of beer, watching football and that's pretty of, funny. Yeah. Those eyes are pretty funny too. I, I could imagine you could just, I'm I'm going to be flying tomorrow. So I'm going to be at airports over the, you know, a little bit, but I think that would be funny. Take them around in an airport and just put them in random places. And people are like, why are there little eyes on these things? You know? Yeah. I'm not much into civil disobedience, but yeah, the shopping carts at King Super sometimes have ads for like insurance agents or real estate agents. And sometimes uh, I've adorned those with googly eyes. Yeah, I think that's okay because at the end of the day, like, would ma- especially at an airport, someone would smile. You know, you're standing at the urinal and then you see like two, you know, googly eyes. <laughs> I think it would actually draw attention to whatever it is. I, it, I quite like it doing it for some things. Like, I don't mind real estate agents or insurance things, but like personal injury lawyers, like, come on. I think it's kind of funny to adorn their ads with googly eyes. Although I'll probably get sued now f- by them. So, yeah, it could have uh, been anyone. So, and that that was just an entertaining story. That wasn't true. True. 